So is there a similarity between people hiding their Jewish identity at that time and Momo making an appearance on camera as usual? Hi, little boy. You're supposed to be off camera right now. That's okay. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Just let it roll. Just for the record, Momo is a staunch Zionist, okay? Let nobody make a mistake. Come on, jump on the couchy. Come on. You got to go on the couch. Come on, let's go. Metaphysical dualism is uh -huh. the idea that all of reality is... Do you guys like that? I hear on Wine with Adam we're talking about metaphysical <laughs> dualism today. <laughs> you want to finish that glass and then talk about metaphysical dualism? Metaphysical dualism, yeah. yeah. Do you love it when my professor can still correct me like on camera <laughs> and make were, me look like an ass on my own welcome. show? Action. Action. Okay, great. Hi, welcome to Wine with Adam. I'm your host, Adam Scott Bellows, and today we have a wonderful show for you and an even better guest. Today, uh, we are filming from the center of Tel Aviv, and uh, I'd like to introduce my very special guest, Dr. David Graysbord. Dr. David Graysbord is the Kurson Professor at the University of Arizona for Judaic Studies. We're going to be talking about his book, The New Zionist, that was published last year, and uh, we are going to taste some wine. David, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. I really appreciate it. Today we are going to be tasting the 2018 Jezreel Winery Argaman. You can find it at wineonthevine.com. If you want to plant a vine with the Jezreel Winery, you can do that at wineonthevine.org. The Argaman grape is actually a 100% indigenous grape to the land of Israel. And now this wine has become the highest rated Israeli wine out of Israeli wines. So. Do me a favor, tell me what you taste, tell me what you smell, and uh, let's give it a whirl really quickly. Ooh. Mm. Very nice. Chaim, thank Chaim, you for being here for with me today. Me. Thank you for like, having uh, me. Appreciate it. So David, let me ask you a question. I think it'd be very interesting for everybody to find out how do we know each other. How do we know each other? Well, um, I'm a professor at the University of Arizona. You were a student at the University of Arizona. So I know you from the time that you were a student. I think we probably met around 2010, I want to say. Um, you sat in on one or two of my classes, but more than anything, you were an advisee of mine because you were writing a thesis right. on Jewish uh, nationalism and actually Palestinian nationalism. Um, in the Yishuv period. Mm -hmm. And so I was at least one of your advisors for that. So that was, that was fun. That was a fun time. If I'm correct, you're, you're working on your third book. Right. One was on Converso identity and post-Inquisition Spain. In, actually, throughout the Inquisition. Right? Throughout the Inquisition. Yeah. And, and then uh, the next book that you published is called The New Zionists, Young American Jews, Jewish National Identity and Israel. What's the main thesis of the book? The main thesis of the book is that uh, young American Jews who call themselves Zionists are Zionists because they come from uh, very warm families, proudly Jewish families, in which the concept of the Jewish people is clearly conveyed to them as something like worthwhile and something worth uh, preserving because they uh, have uh, been immersed uh, alongside Israel, uh, alongside Israelis, um, if not actually in Israel during key moments of their lives, particularly in late adolescence or in their early adulthood when their sense of their own independence is, is taking shape. Um, I've also uh, learned that politics and Israeli policies have little, if nothing, to do with the Israel attachments of my subjects. In other words, um, uh, being a Zionist has to do with national identity, not with um, partisan politics, partisan politics or you know who's up and who's down, and you know what happened yesterday, the Kalandia crossing or whatever. What brought you from Inquisition period conversos to modern Jewish identity, and why 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 did you write the book? Yeah, you know it's funny in in uh, let's say academic circles, I'm known as one of those guys who knows a lot about the 17th century, about the Inquisition, about conversos, and so forth. The truth is that I study those subjects because I'm more interested than anything else in matters of identity. In other words, 
how do people decide who they are? What does being part of a community mean to them? And what they want to do, how they set about you know, doing it. And so um, essentially the questions that I've asked of conversos, for example, what it mean to them to be Jewish or to be Christian or to be neither or to be both, uh, how do they express themselves in social reality, particularly when their identity was so stigmatized, so persecuted, these are essentially the same questions that I'm asking in my second book of uh, young American Jews, people of Generation Y, so to speak. I'm really confused though why young American Jews aren't necessarily considered to be persecuted. How is there a connection between... Ah, right. So, th very good question. It is true that Jewish identity as such is not, uh, let's say, in most circles in the United States, it's not persecuted. However, being a Zionist is increasingly unpopular. I think Zionism carries for young American Jews a tremendous stigma. Uh, that stigma is felt in various contexts, for example, in the context of higher education, in the context, context even of um, high schools, uh, in certain, let's say, highly politicized progressive circles. So you might say that those young Jews who identify as Zionists, whatever that means to them, have to bear the burden of that stigma. They are often attacked, they're uh, ostracized, they're uh, vilified for their attachment to Israel. And so in that sense, they, th the American Jews that I'm, I'm studying are like the conversos who bore the stigma of having come from Jews, of being descended from Jews. If, I, if I'm correct, kind of what you're getting at is that there are a lot of questions and feelings that are coming up with modern young Jews who are, let's say, in crisis with their identity because of the, the situations around them when it comes to anti-Zionist activity that are very similar to the early conversos. Right. Uh, you know, it's very interesting. Um, Jews in the United States often pass as white. Right? In other words, if they, if they encode their appearance in very traditional Jewish terms, they are perceived as Jews. But if they don't, then in a sense, uh, Jews pass incognito in American society. And that was true of conversos, new Christians, mm -hmm. in, uh, in early modern and late, in, in late uh, medieval Spain and Portugal. Nobody could tell you who was or wasn't uh, a descendant of Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, so the fear of being infiltrated by this alien population was what drove um, anxieties in Spanish and Portuguese society about how to identify, uh, you know, alleged uh, crypto Jews, alleged secret Jews. And it, and it very much seems uh, that many people in North America today are very worried about that given the huge conversation now about Jews and whiteness. Yes. and. Um, the activities that you see on college campuses comparing Israel to a white colonial enterprise and that Jewish people who are not Israeli exactly. and who might not even necessarily be Zionists are being connected to this idea right, right. of this colonial white oppressor. Yes, yeah, exactly. In the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement, I think the, the Jews are white and therefore privileged and therefore evil um, narrative has become much more prominent. But also, uh, I think, within uh, Jewish communities in the diaspora, especially in the Western world, in, in, in France, in the United States, in Canada, etc., are we indeed white? Because I think for many, many decades, if not centuries, uh, Jews uh, perceived, I think they perceived correctly, that the way to fit in, to be left alone, was to uh, present themselves as white, regardless of, of their actual identity, physiognomy right. and, and their identity. Because, you know, we can go into this at length, but uh, uh, labels like black, white, they are scientifically very, very sketchy. Mm -hmm. um, they, they're untenable, I would say. Mm -hmm. But regardless, I think uh, uh, Jews did perceive that this, this was something they needed to adopt, in a sense a white identity so that they would be acceptable. And now, of course, when well, a whiteness white passing is, identity, so to exactly, speak. Exactly, yeah. a passing identity. And now that it's stigmatized, at least in some quarters, now it becomes problematic. So the question is, are we really white? Did, did this uh, Even though they never saw themselves as that prior to the advent of them interested. Exactly, yeah. So let right. me ask you a question. The, the main thing that I feel like that you laid out, there, there are obviously some 
political things that are in the book without trying to be political, just because of the nature of the questions that you're asking. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what is the main thing that you saw that creates the new Zionists of Generation mm -hmm. yeah, Y? Yeah, yeah. What, 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 you know, takes these American-born Jews and either gets them extremely heavily involved in Jewish life, where they they are also marrying Jewish and having Jewish children and mm -hmm. staying involved in their community, and/or making aliyah. Mm -hmm. What what's the main thing that yeah. you learn? Yeah. Okay, not to be too jargony, but the outcome, this outcome, this Zionist outcome, is what you might call in, in academic uh, prose, multifactorial. In other words, there are many factors that account for the outcome. Okay. Now, the, the factors can occur in different combinations. Sometimes a few of the factors are missing. Sometimes they're all there. It varies. However, I think one factor that absolutely uh, is fundamental, that, that actually occurs in all the cases that I surveyed, and we're talking about thir you know, upwards of 35 cases, is um, the familial context. In other words, my subjects are all, to one extent or another, reared, raised in very happy, proud Jewish families. Does that, that necessarily mean Zionist? No, not necessarily. It means, but it does mean the following, that somehow my subjects always, not always, but early on perceived that there is such a thing as the Jewish people and that this Jewish people is kind of like an extended family. In a way, it's an extension of their own family. So did going to Jewish day school or summer camp or anything like that have anything to do with it? Or is it no, just... No, no, certainly. Uh, th those are some of the important factors. Okay. In fact, there are very good studies that would show that those uh, kids who go to uh, sleep away summer Jewish camp are much more in, inclined in favor of Zionism than those who don't. Okay. The more years you spend in, in you know, experiencing a, a formal Jewish education, the more substantive your Jewish identity, the more likely you are to be attached to Israel. So let me ask you uh, another question Sure. Uh, about proud Jews and proud Zionists. Um, it's something that the Jewish world doesn't have a lot of these days uh, and that every organization is complaining about. And if you look at the last 20, 30 years of policy, Okay, not political policy, but the policies of these nonprofits, the strategies that have been laid out, the billions of dollars that have been spent in cultivating identity. What's the most controversial thing that you found mm. about all of that, yeah. that, that yeah. stuff? Because you know, one of the things that I, I took away when working on the, mm -hmm. the, the, the book with you, but also as a finished product, because I was more involved in the beginning than I was with the, the actual sure. writing of the book, um, was that none of these subjects spoke about any type of Jewish nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Now, there could be trips to Israel or something like that, but there was no organization that was like, this organization helped me cultivate my Jewish identity. Okay, maybe a camp, maybe going to school. Some of my subjects did mention their parents' involvement, and in some cases, their own involvement in legacy Jewish organizations. I think you are right, though, to perceive that none of my subjects considered that involvement to be decisive in their identity formation. There are two problems okay. that I was able to, I think, uh, put my finger on. I didn't discover these problems. I simply uh, found evidence to support their existence. Um, the first problem is that Jewish organizations are precisely that. They're organizations. They are not necessarily critiquing any status quo. They're not trying to change any status quo. Mm -hmm. In fact, they're not moving at all. Mm -hmm. I do see a generational, uh, let's say, riff on older forms of Zionism, a kind of rediscovery of Zionism in its, in, in its, uh, at, at its core, right? Um, and, you know, I can see some problems with the, the gaps that some of my subjects uh, display in their knowledge of Jewish history, of, of the Hebrew language, etc. So, so let me ask you a question. Uh, speaking of the Hebrew language, how important is the spread of the Hebrew language when it comes to creating these new Zionists? Uh, you know, this is, uh, this is old news, right? Uh, Hebrew is fundamental to Zionism. The, um, the leaders of the Zionist movement in the 19th century, 20th century, they were people who changed their identities, they changed their names by Hebraicizing their names. They had to create in themselves a new Jew. In other words, 
as Zionists, my subjects are in a sense new Jews. They're not new. Uh, they're not reinventing Zionism. They're right. actually going back to Zionism in a way that their their own parents sometimes, their own families, and these organizations that we've been uh, talking about are not really able to do. So that the problem that why I, why yeah. do you think that is? Just because they're not okay, movements? One, wonder, because what, one, what, but but. Yeah. but you have the conservative movement. Yeah. You have the reform movement. These are all, you know, even though some of these movements weren't rooted in Zionism in the yeah. beginning, you yeah. can't say that the reform movement isn't a Zionist movement. Uh, correct. I, look, and, and you have BBYO, you have USY, sure, sure. you have uh, NIFTY. American Jewry has configured itself for historical reasons as a religious minority. In the American context, Jewish nationality or ethno-nationality has been de-emphasized. It hasn't been lost. It hasn't been, let's say, heavily stigmatized. Very often the chair people, the staffers of multiple American Jewish organizations will tell you, we are not just a religion, we are a people, right? However, the regnant or the, let's say, the dominant model of American Jewish identity leans very heavily on traditional religious belief and practice. Now, it's not, that's not a problem. That's actually very good. On the other hand, I think that American Jews have internalized a non-Jewish conception of religion. Well, that reminds me of something that you wrote about. Uh, before publishing this book, you wrote an entire article about Judaism not even being a Jewish concept. And the term Judaism not even being a Jewish word. Right. How, I, I just say, I, I, I'm sorry to yes. interrupt you. No, no, but how but, is this related? But, but, to but you? how is that? Because it sounds like that's what you're getting sure. at. Sure. And I have to say, I'm not the only one to notice that uh, Judaism, the word, is not a, and the concept are not Jewish, right? Uh, Judaismos is the Greek term that the Greek empire builders gave to the culture of the Judeans. U Judaismos. Judaismos. Uh, and then eventually Jews adopted it mostly to speak about themselves to non-Jews, right? And, and uh, we can go back into the 19th century and see how, for example, Moses Mendelssohn uh, tried to configure this thing called Judaism in order to present it to enlightened Germans, enlightened Central Europeans, as an analog to Christianity, as a monotheistic, you know, uh, uh, ethical uh, construct that was going to allow Jews to participate as full equals in an enlightened society, etc., etc. Uh, my point is this, though, that American Jews, for better or worse, I, I think mostly for worse, have, have internalized the notion that they are, in essence, Christians without Jesus, right? That what distinguishes them, what defines them, is something called Judaism, and that that Judaism is a religion in the Christian sense of the term, which essentially means a series of theological propositions yeah, that call for faith. In other words, you have to have faith in those, that those propositions are true, and a host of religious rituals of worship that are undertaken, that are performed within the confines of private spaces, the private house of worship, the private home, right? Now, Jewish civilization is none of that. First of all, we have the idea that Judaism is not a Jewish concept. Uh, number two, um, at no point in the Tanakh, at no point in the rabbinic corpus, are Jews enjoined to have faith in particular theological propositions. The theological propositions are there, but they're assumed to be true. We all know that you know, that the Torah was given at Sinai, that Jews have, a, 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 you know, X number of obligations that they have to fulfill in order to earn what? In order to earn freedom and sovereignty in their homeland, right? They have to follow mitzvot so that they configure themselves as an ethical community in the promised land. That's, I mean, that's not the explanation of Judaism that most people that's Organic. right. Uh, I, look, I, we, can, we can simplify a bit and say that for many, many Jews in the United States, including many rabbis, to be a Jew means to uphold the golden rule yeah, and to, uh, to embrace what I call the BDS paradigm of Jewish identity. I don't mean, what do you mean boycott, by the BDS divestment, paradigm? sanctions. I mean bagels, davening, and Seinfeld. Okay? 
Being an observant Jew, being worshipful of a deity does not make you Jewish, even according to halakha, okay? Halakha says basically you're a Jew, you're, you're Israel, okay, first of all, you're Israel, if your mother is Jewish, or if you become naturalized, if you undertake a giyur, mm -hmm. a, a, you know, and join the Jewish people through specific, uh, you know, a specific ritual and educational process. Uh, in other words, it's not what, what Christians would call a religious conversion. Oh, I believe in... You no, know, it's, it's, a, and it's tribal entry, so to it's speak. It's tribal entry, exactly. It's naturalization. American Jews' adoption, willy-nilly, of a religionized Judaism, right, prevents them from really even appreciating, from understanding, from immersing themselves in Jews' tribal identity. The new Zionists are people who have rediscovered that tribal identity and have, you know, held on to it. And they're saying, this is mine. I love it. This is who I am. So let me ask you a question. I'm getting ready for my bar mitzvah. I want you to look at me like I'm 13 years old. If you could teach me one thing out of everything that you've learned, what would it be? Wow. Hmm. Dude, you are the heir of a multi-millennial civilization. It's tough as hell to be a Jew, but it is the, the most wonderful thing you could have hoped for. L'chaim. Mm. L'chaim. Pretty good. I want to say thank you to my very special guest, Dr. David Graysboard, uh, and stopping by and bringing us a copy of his new book, The, the New Zionists. You can find it online at Amazon.com. If you want to plant a vine at the Jezreel Winery, you can do that at wineofthevine.org. And if you want to buy the wine that we're drinking, the Argaman, the highest rated Israeli wine, you can find it at wineofthevine.com. Thank you so much. And don't forget, when you're drinking your Israeli wine, drink it with somebody you love. L'chaim. L'chaim.